Oddball Show features content intended for mature audiences. If you'd like to view a content warning before listening, please check out the episode description. The views put forth by our hosts and our guests reflect the speaker's opinions and not the official stance of Oddball Foundation. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoy the show. Oryx, hello. Hey, Jason. Good it's to really see you. good to see you again, man. Good to see you. The last time we talked, it was like three years ago. So the pandemic had to have been, uh, was just brewing. I don't even know right. if they had even like, I don't even think they had put a title to COVID yet. I think right. it was like, it was just like this thing that was happening. Right. But anyway, um, so I'm here with Oryx Cohen. I'm very excited to talk to him and get into some of his story since the last time we talked to him. I think uh, last time we talked to Oryx, we talked to him about his his uh, his uh, movie, Healing Voices. Today, we're going to talk about a little bit, uh, some more stuff that's going on with Oryx, get to know where he's up to now, and also uh, talk about some of these things like uh, like emotional CPR and things like that, and what is that, and, and kind of get into that. So um, I'd like to welcome Oryx to the show. Uh, Oryx Cohen is the CEO of National Empowerment Center, a uh, consumer-run national technical assistance and resource center fostering recovery, self-determination, and community inclusion. He works with states that have an undeveloped survivor voice to become peer-driven and recovery-oriented. He has worked with Mind Freedom International and their oral history project to document stories of abuse, empowerment, and healing in the mental health system. He's a strong advocate for changing oppressive mental health policies, and his lived experience greatly informs his work. Oryx Cohen, welcome to Oddball Show. Thank you, Jason. Great Good to, to see you again. I'm so, glad to see you're still cooking. Yeah, no, I'm, all, I'm always cooking. You know, I had a daughter. That's my that's my big that's my big news. Oh wow. Yeah. Congratulations. That's, a, yeah. that's amazing. That's awesome. You it's, have a glow, you have a glow about you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Her name is Emerson. Um, she's my life and my light and she's great. Um, I know we were talking about, um, uh, y- you also are really into, uh, y- you were supporting your daughter into playing basketball for a while. And then you, uh, now you are, te- now you're coaching basketball. Yep, that's right. Yeah, I got I played I played when I was a kid. I started when I was 5 and I just fell in love with the game from a very young age and just played all the time. I would play like 8 hours a day and just loved the game and played in high school and played in college. Um and then after college, I would always want to play in different city leagues and all that. Um but I can tell you that I I I think I enjoy coaching more than I ever enjoyed playing because um, I just get to touch so many kids' lives, not just, you know, teaching them the basketball skills, but there's a lot of life lessons you can learn from team sports. And um, that's that's what I really um, get out of it is when teams come together um, and, and it's no longer a bunch of individuals, but it's a team working together. Um, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful experience. And I just have a lot of fun. I coach, I I coach girls and, um, they're, they're a lot of fun. So let me ask you, you know, your, um, this, the way that you just described teamwork and team building that probably has a lot to do with how you run the national empowerment center as ceo you know team building and things like that right oh yeah there's definitely a lot of crossover between everything that i do um and at nec yeah it's 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 about building communities building teams you know right now i feel like we have a really strong um staff a staff team at National Empowerment Center and a team of consultants that are amazing and a team of emotional CPR trainers. So yeah, all of it is kind of similar. You know, we, we want to, we want to build cohesive teams that work really well together. Um, so yeah, it's, it's pretty awesome. So I want to get into that because it sounds like you are, you, you are, you're, 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 you're really excited about what you're doing at National Empowerment Center. I can tell because, I mean, it sounds like you just have like a, a glow in what you're doing. You're really proud of your team. Um, what are, what are some of, what, what are some of the things that you do that, you know, are team building or, 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 you know, to people who um are, uh, you know, I, I'm a, the president of Oddball Foundation. I guess I have to put my president of Oddball Foundation hat on now. Uh, no longer Jason writes podcast, uh, oddball show. Uh, yeah, I created a nonprofit, um, 
and I'm the president of it. And I, uh, I'd i love to hear some advice on how to motivate people, um, how to get them to really like enjoy their work and things like that. Now I'm going to take my oddball show, <laughs> my oddball foundation president hat off and listen. Yeah. Well, um, it's, that's, that's a really good question. Um, so some of the things that I believe in, um, and it goes back to my early days of, working with the Freedom Center, which was a volunteer organization of, of psychiatric survivors, no government funding. Um, and we believed in, in a couple things. And one was relationships. So building relationships with whoever it is you work with, that's the foundation if you have an authentic relationship. And number two, inspiration. So what, what are you inspired to do in your work? And we are, we're blessed that the grants that we have and our mission um, allow us to do what we're inspired to do. So I, t instead of, um, you know, there are certain things that you have to do in your job roles and, you know, there's probably things we all have to do that, oh, that maybe I, that's not my favorite thing to do, but it's important to also kind of cultivate uh, people's strengths and what are, what are people inspired to do and that's what that's what I try to do as a leader with the National Empowerment Center and I think it's really starting to come to fruition because um, all the members of our staff are doing things that they're really excited about um, so then that just makes the work easier um, and, it, and it's not like you have to keep your eye on people or you have to um, you know kind of micromanage right uh because people are are doing the work because they want to do it and the work the quality of work then becomes so much better that way too that sounds great that sounds like the the right kind of atmosphere for for any kind of business and um also you know this business national empowerment center there's some heart there's there's some meaning to it um Tell me a little bit about, well, tell our listeners of the Oddball Show, what National Parliament Center does? What are some of the, the the things that someone would do who was at National Parliament Center? Sure. So um, one thing to know is National Empowerment Center has been around for, this is our 31st year. 31st year, so a very long time. And it was founded by some giants in our movement. Judy Chamberlain, Dan Fisher, and Pat Deegan. Um, and so National Empowerment Center is a national peer-run organization. So all of us, including the board, um, have lived experience with mental health issues. So it's peer-run. Um, and uh, we're mostly a training and education organization. So um, we we uh, we have a very small staff actually. So it sounds big, <laughs> center and all that. Well, we yeah we're we're we actually went um, completely virtual. We're completely virtual. So we kind of like to think of ourselves as small but mighty. Um, and so we only have a few core staff, but we have a lot of consultants that we work with. A lot. Um, most of those are emotional CPR trainers. So at this point, um, emotional CPR is our core training, and I'm sure we're going to get into that a little bit yeah, more. Yeah, we're going to talk about that in uh, a little bit, yeah. But we also do um, training around hearing voices, and uh, we do a finding our voice training, which is uh, more of an advocacy training for people. Um, we do trauma and tr we do trauma training, we do basic recovery training, we do peer support training. Um, our website is very comprehensive in terms of resources, uh, and, and that's the education piece of it. Um, so you can, we have a store that you can go to where you can find books and materials that you can't really find anywhere else. Um, so, um, and we do webinars. That's another part of the education piece. Uh, we'll do international webinars on various topics. Um, and then the 
Um, another piece of our work has been technical assistance. So um, you mentioned in the intro that we've helped several organizations start up, several peer-run organizations. So we're a national organization, but we've helped several more local and statewide peer-run organizations form from scratch. So we do like organizational development and leadership development. Um, and then I guess the final thing um, is we, we have a lot of experience organizing conferences. So for several years, every three years, we would organize the National Alternatives Conference, which is the largest peer run conference in the country. Um, so, and we're still, you know, we still support that conference but now the National Coalition is organizing that conference. But um, so conference organizing is another um, kind of strength of ours. Orix, I went to that conference in 2017. I met someone named Rokas Lupik, and I had him on the podcast. And was that was Boston? Yeah, that was in Boston, yeah. Yeah, we organized that one, yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow, I had a blast at that. Um, I definitely, definitely used the hotel room when you had too much going on. You had to sit down right, and think about right. it. That was really nice that they had that, though, because I definitely used that. I was like, oh, because, you know, I mean – I, I, at that time, I, I think I've gotten a lot better, but at that time I was really, you know, my meds weren't correct or maybe I hadn't done so much personal work on myself, but I yeah. still had a lot of trouble being in, 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 uh, in, in public and things like that. And I definitely used, uh, I mean, there was resources at the alternatives conference to like catch your breath kind of place. And then, and I used those definitely. Um, but I remember meeting Rokas Lupik and having a really great conversation with him, and he his his whole thing was about um, he is uh, oh geez I, I'm uh, he's from he's oh I don't want to mess up where he's from the Netherlands Netherlands he's, he's yeah. oh do you know Rokas okay so yeah, he's yeah. from the, he's from the Netherlands and uh, you can check out the Oddball Show podcast that he did um, and we talked about um, how they they have these art centers um, these uh, patient live patient run art centers in uh netherlands and how how different it is than and 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 how don't they have i mean i think they said they had one in new york too or something yeah. like that but and they have a living museum he does he runs a living museum living museum that's what yeah. it's called yeah, yeah 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 and i thought that was brilliant and i think that you know the, you know these uh the, the you know going back to the the National Empowerment Center, you know, I think what what you're doing by helping out other um, peer groups that are smaller, you're kind of organizing on a wider scale, any kind of people who are uh, kind of starting up peer run organizations. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. For years and years, that was our primary focus was to support um, other peer run organizations that were that we're starting. We still do a little bit of that. The new grant that we have is more focused on training, but um, yeah, that's that's been historically a big thing that we do. And by the way, I visited Rokas. I'm very good friends with Rokas and oh, yeah. I've, my whole family visited him in the Netherlands. Really? In Harlem. We got, I got to go to the living museum. It's amazing, amazing, amazing when act to actually be there. Um, uh, with, with all this wonderful artwork and people. And we did an emotional CPR training actually in the living museum. Um, and then he took us for this is a little bit of an aside, but he, he, he took us on a boat ride down one of the canals in Harlem on his boat with my whole family, which is a memory I'll always remember. It was oh so my, awesome. wow. <laughs> that sounds amazing. Uh, you know, uh, just to be at, at a living museum and then just have that experience afterwards is awesome. Um, you know, uh, the one, the one thing I, I, I remember about uh, what I enjoyed about the alternatives conference was, uh, you know, there was, it was, it was, it was really well organized and there was a lot of different things that I, I learned about wellness toolboxes at one of them. I forgot who, 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 I, who I spoke with, who did the wellness toolboxing, but it was really great. It was very interactive. We had great conference, you know, great speakers. That I got a T-shirt, which was great. Um, but let me ask you, what is so? It's twenty twenty three now. Things have kind of changed during due to the pandemic. What's kind of your mission now? What What is your What is your goal with National Power Center? What do you guys want to do? 
Yeah. Um, well, I think that since the last time we've talked, um, we've really um, kind of put the gas pedal down on emotional CPR and expanding that training. Um, it's gone way beyond mental health. Now we have all kinds of different organizations interested and involved, uh, fire departments. Uh, really? Yeah. Uh, we've got um, the United Way. Um, yeah. So just all kinds of different, different organizations. Um, so the goal is really that, that, um, you know, it, the goal is big. It's a big, big goal. <laughs> it's great. We want, big, we want, big we want to, we want to create a, uh, you know, a better world for folks. And yeah. that involves getting out of our kind of, out of our mental health silo, so to speak. Exactly. And, um, teaching anybody how to better support folks in their communities so um so that that's kind of the big goal but so so training is definitely up there we've got some we've got a new training that we're developing that i could i could mention too um, oh, i love that um so works i want to talk about this idea how you want to make things more universal because i think i think we 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 talk about mental health right and then it becomes like this certain silo, like you said. But you talk about wellness, you know, wellness in general, it opens up. It opens up to all sorts of different things. It doesn't right. have to do with diagnosis or anything like that or medications. It talks about wellness and emotional CPR, um, which I want to get into what what that is. Um, I, I, I imagine that is a, a, a you're trying to branch out of any kind of mental health system and into a wider universal platform for people to adopt that's not like 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 mental health folk like it's mental health focus but it's not like i guess clinical or something like that right right so um so i can dive in if you, if you want me to yeah, let's talk about uh let's talk about emotional cpr because it seems like okay. it's something that you're really passionate yeah about. yeah um so before i jump into that just the other major thing that we're really proud of um, in the last couple of years is our DEI work and our diver cultural diversity and inclusion. Yeah. Um, so um, we've, we've, uh, we're kind of walking, walking the talk too, in terms of, of who, who we're hiring in, ter in terms of staff and um, uh, consultants. And we have a training, we even do training now, implicit bias training, um, so we're really proud of of um, kind of our facelift in in that in that area, and that's something that we continue to to work on, uh, being culturally diverse and um, you know accessible to to multiple different communities, and that's very related to emotional CPR, which I'll get into. Um, so, emotional CPR. What is emotional CPR? It is. What is emotional CPR? It, it is a practice. It's really a practice. So um, it was developed originally to be a practice to use when, when someone's in a severe emotional crisis. So someone's, you know, hearing intense voices or is suicidal or um, extremely anxious or um, manic or what, whatever it is um, that someone is going through. Um, we designed a uh, a practice, and there's a training to teach the practice. Uh, a practice that anybody can use to support someone. Um, so it was developed by people with lived experience, which is really exciting. Um, it was actually a response to mental health first aid, which I'm sure a lot of people have heard of, um, which was developed by professionals, and it has a different um perspective and it's a very different training um this one is developed by people with lived experience because we're like hey i've been through something similar i know it helped me in those situations and um and this is what it is this is these are the things that helped me um and that's how it was developed a bunch of, like 20 people with lived experience um in 2009 uh, develop this emotional CPR training. And it's not a step-by-step -step 
cookie cutter method because if you've ever tried to support someone or you've ever been in crisis yourself, you know that really step-by-step -step cookie cutter things don't really work. And so what we need in those situations is real people um, care, really being caring and being with. So we teach a lot about being with and this and the C stands for our connection. And that's an authentic heart to heart connection and more of an emotional connection than a kind of a head to head connecting on thoughts and verbal, like ver verbal connection. So the most important thing is emotional heart to heart connection. Sometimes people who are in crisis can't really speak, for example. Um, so if you can just sit with someone and connect with them non verbally, that can, that can be really powerful. And there's lots of ways you can do that. It might There might be a verbal connection, but it's finding what that connection is. And it's really authentic heart to heart. Then the, the P is um, a little bit of a cheat because it stands for empowerment, uh, <laughs> which doesn't start with a P, but we like the P for power. I love that. I love that so much. Uh, That's awesome. Yeah. And so empowerment, We I can't empower you. Nobody can empower me, but through um, relationships, we can both feel our empowered. We can both feel empowered. So right. we believe that people are whole and people have power. And through connection, people are going to find that power. And what does that mean, that me empowerment? It means choice. A lot of times it means choice. Like, So it's not that I know what's best for you. I'm not going to fix you. I'm not going to tell you what to do. But together we can explore what might work for you in the right now. And it's amazing what happens. People are like, oh, um, I I think I need to exercise more, or um I can call so and so, or I can do this. So we tap into people's personal power, and then you see that empowerment come up for themselves and they're and they're they're making their own decisions about how to get through a really serious crisis. And and that's so much more powerful than someone telling you what to do and guide and just guiding your every step because then they the person doesn't feel like they did it themselves. And it, is that really sustainable? Is that really sustainable? No, a lot of times we see a lot of revolving doors still in the mental health system, people back and forth into the hospital. A lot of it has to do with lack of empowerment that they haven't been empowered to um, make their own decisions and find what works for them. That's that's what's sustainable. And then the R is revitalization. That's where we hope to get people feel revitalized. So that could be a sense of newfound energy and hope and connection with other people. Um, and it also could be a sense of grounding, um, and not like all all over the place. Because when I've been through my altered states, I that's where I go. I'm like, I have plenty of energy. It's just not controlled. Yeah, <laughs> controlled yeah. energy. So I can relate to that, Alex, for sure. Yeah. So revitalization is is the last part of the the CPR. And so, so it's CPR. connection, empowerment, and revitalization. Yes. Yeah, and then in the in the training we teach through real plays, so um, we don't call call them role plays. They're not role plays um, <clears throat> because they're real plays because two people connect authentically over something real going on in somebody's life, and that doesn't have to be like the most intense thing. It could be a three on a scale of one to ten, but it allows us to practice emotional CPR, kind of like with CPR. You pra you have to practice right, CPR. right. Uh, yeah. So you practice emotional CPR in real time, doing real plays in the training. And then we found that's really been super effective and super powerful. And we try to practice emotional CPR throughout the whole course of the training. So it is a group training. So when we're when we're practicing emotional CPR as a group, we call it we CPR. And we have, there's also me CPR, which is very important, which is very related to self-help hmm. and, uh, and self-care, self-care. Um, <clears throat> because 
I can't really support anybody else if I'm not taking care of myself. So the, yeah, those are some of the components of emotional CPR. Wow. That is fantastic. And you're bringing this to firefighters and paramedics and different, and you said the United way. And, and so this is, this is a brilliant. Uh, Veterinar- veterinarians are another big group we've brought it to. They, they, veterinarians, really? Yeah, yeah they, they, it's, uh, a lot of veterinarians interesting. struggle because they're Probably. they're getting sick pets all the time, and they're getting. I, I don't even know how you could possibly do it, or I, yeah. I, 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 if I if I had to deal with my dog being sick every day and having to take care of him, uh, I'm getting teary. I just think about it. No way would I ever want to. Yeah, you probably get some wins, but you probably get a lot of losses. Yeah, so. yeah. So, yeah, really, this is a universal training. We've we've trained entire school districts. And now, That's great. Uh, um, yeah, actually, emotional CPR has been offered as curriculum in high school, so an actual class that high school students take. Um so, that's fantastic and and is this now or you're in massachusetts is this uh is this a uh, statewide thing across the board or is, in in all the high schools or could it uh, be well this is international the training is internet is international so all over the place not just massachusetts all over the world um but so, do I mean, all this do all the schools in, in massachusetts? massachusetts no actually it's interesting massachusetts is not one of the states that we've um We've taught emotional CPR. Wow. In Hold on. I got to do a call to, a call to the Massachusetts. The right. Massachusetts, uh, you really should get on this emotional CPR with uh, with all the high schools. So yeah, yeah. You know, if, you're, if you if you uh, want to talk to your legislators or you think this is a good idea, you know, talk to the teacher unions and stuff. Get the emotional CPR in the in, the, in every school in Massachusetts. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's mostly <laughs> been it's been Vermont. Um, it's been Indiana and Arizona. French so Lick, right? French What's Lick. That? French Lick. French Lick. Yeah, Larry Bird. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? But very funny, Oryx. You were talking about altered states the other day, right? And I'm just gonna say this. So um on a somber note, um I lost my uh my father in law last Wednesday. And um it is very raw still, and I have to still deal with his wake tomorrow. So very, very raw. And and because of that. I ended up losing a little bit of reality. Uh, I don't know if I think this might happen to people when they when they lose someone, they oh, hear yeah. the person's voice or yeah. or whatever. <laughs> so it lasted for a little while. I had to take a Haldol nap eventually. But um, I was thinking, what a great idea, you know, if Larry Bird was to come. To, I was like, I'm gonna make this happen because I was like, you know, in my in, in, in your alter state, you're like, I can yeah. move the world around. You know? yeah. I was like, all right. So in my ideal world, Larry Bird would come and be like, uh, like the coach of the Boston Celtics. And and, then yeah. I, and I was like, that could happen. And then I was thinking, and I don't want to say a very unpopular opinion, but I was thinking like one of the star Celtics could get traded um, to, to the West coast. So there'd be a rivalry between the two, the two stars. And then like one of them would bring back Steph Curry to go to, to Massachusetts, <laughs> to Boston. I was like, cause he's got a great work ethic, you know? And I was thinking, like in my head, I was like, this all makes sense, man. <laughs> and then I was like, you know what? I'm not sleeping. It's been like three days. I think I need to, I think I need to take care of myself here. Now, when you were talking about emotional CPR, no one told me that I should do that. In fact, I wasn't empowered. I was told, Hey, look, you got to get some sleep from my wife. Cause she knows, but it would have been a far more impactful thing. If someone was like, Hey man, I get it. You, uh, you think like, you know, Larry Bird should come uh, to, you know, you believe you can make it happen. I understand. Let's talk, let's talk about it. You know, and you like, Talk about it on this like one to one level instead of, you know what? You need to get some sleep. You need to get some sleep now. You can't leave until you get some sleep. Um, and I think like if you can talk to someone when you can talk to someone when they're in the midst of an altered state. First of all, you're an excellent peer because I mean I think that it's uh, it's it's I think peer support specialists are trained in this kind of stuff to deal with altered states. I don't think people who are outside of the peer world are. Um, right. and they don't get it and they want to, and this is how I feel or they want to put out the fire immediately. They want to put out your fire immediately yeah. and it might be just to throw medication at it, to put out your fire and then you will stay on medications for as long as humanly possible. And I know that I've, I've, 
I don't want to go back. I mean, my oddball show listeners know this, but I, I, I went into, I was very close to coming off my meds. It didn't work. It was actually last March that um, I, I, I loaded my meds too much. I got hospitalized. Um, and then consequently, not, not to say it's weird or not, but the same day that I got hospitalized is the same day my, my father-in-law passed away. So uh, this year. So very crazy. I hate March. I hate March Oryx. Mm. March Madness. There's definitely some truth to it. Um, but what I was getting at is um, I think sometimes emotional CPR, right? And uh, some of these peer support modalities and things like that, and also hearing voices and things like that. These things are designed to say like your altered reality is okay. Yeah. It is okay to feel like that. If you want to feel like you can control, you know, whatever you, you can't, you, it's your reality. And, and, and we respect that instead of, um, you know, you gotta go, you gotta go to the hospital. Right. right, right. You know? Yeah. So Absolutely. how, um, how does, how, how does this, um, work? You said, you said me, me CPR. So it's me connection empowerment. Um, and, yeah. and, uh, yeah. what's, what's the, what's the last one? Revitalization. Revitalization. So how, how is that? How do you know when you are, you have to use CPR on yourself? Um, I think that's very individual. So like, um, I could just speak for myself. Like when I know I need me CPR, um, it would be those times when I'm feeling pretty stressed out, when I'm not sleeping, when I'm mm -hmm. having trouble sleeping. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I could be feeling really anxious or um, I feel tension in my shoulders and my head. Um, I can feel a like a knot in my stomach. Mm -hmm. um, or anytime I'm just feeling really worn down and tired. Yeah. Like, it's probably not a great time to, you know, initiate a new project or any really do anything. Like, I, you know, I've learned to just, okay, I need to take a break right now. I need to exercise. All this can wait. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I need to get some sleep. I need to spend time with my family, yeah. you know, the, thing, the things that I do for me CPR. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So Oryx, um, when, you know, when people are feeling, um, the way you were talking about knowing your body and stuff, I was thinking of like, uh, uh an idea of, um, you know, um, knowing when your body is, is, is hurt and almost like a body keeps the score kind of idea, you yeah. know, uh, the brain body connection. And, uh, do you think that maybe that's understanding not only just trauma in general, but un understanding the brain and body connection is the next step to understanding like where we're going with mental health? Yeah, I would take it a step further, like mind, body, spirit, mind, body, so let's not forget about the spirit right um, right um and that's can be that could mean different for everyone but um to me it just means like we're all connected we all, we all have a deep deep connection with the universe with everything um so that's what it means for for me um and when i've had altered states i've had some pretty deep spiritual connections and during those states and and since that time i've also just had deep spiritual experiences without those you know without having to get lost in those states i guess mm. um yeah so yeah i think that's huge um is and and that's a big part of what we're trying to do with emotional cpr too is um link is is having the mind and the body be um one <laughs> instead of kind of separate my so i think we we're such a like you know we're so in our heads in our in this culture that instead of our hearts because, you mean? yeah yeah instead of our heart that 
sometimes we're, I think we feel trapped up here and we forget about our bodies and our hearts and it's it, they're not separate, but sometimes I think it feels like they are separate because we're so, we're so in here all the time. That's when I think wellness comes into play. That's when I think when you can change mental health treatment, whatever, and just incorporate wellness as almost change it, change the whole modality, nah, modality, man, I hate that word. I don't think I've been using that word since I saw it. I heard it in Goodwill Hunting. I heard it in Goodwill <laughs> Hunting once. Um, no, what I'm trying to get at is if if wellness is really the 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 kind of the core of uh, of of medicine, right? Wellness is the core of medicine. We always take mental health uh, and mental illness, and we equi- we don't put the spirit involved. We don't put the wellness into it. I think often uh, a lot of a lot of people are missing that spiritual element. Um, I know that, you know, sometimes, you know, I think in, in peer world, we can talk about that kind of stuff, but sometimes that stuff's not talked about. I think sometimes uh, the spirit is not always talked about. And, and, and like you said, like the heart, you know, like the, the heart as in like your spiritual center. Um, I think if the brain, the body and the spirit, like you said, are all incorporated into wellness, I think, uh, and then, but I don't think it's taught like that works. I don't think it's, I don't think it's taught like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've, I, I, I'm a big fan of wellness and, you know, the, the eight dimensions of wellness. Um, yeah, much more so than, I think it's, it's just much more dynamic way of looking at, at it than recovery, recovery. Mm-hmm. A lot, a lot of people don't necessarily resonate with that word recovery. Um, like yeah. I'm not recovering from anything. Right. Uh, or yeah, so, or yeah, so um, I I I I like I like wellness. Yeah, I do too. I mean, I think we talk about the eight dimensions of wellness, and but honestly, one thing I was thinking about is in in the in the peer world, and 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 a peer oddball show listeners is someone with lived experience who is in a mental health system, uh, working in but not of the system part of the mental health, uh, the system itself. Um, it also can be someone who's an advocate. Uh, just someone lived experience, just someone who has had a diagnosis, has had trauma, whatever, um, uh, or identifies as a peer. But um, I think like in peer support, specifically, we talk about all these more, these uh, ideas of wellness in, in a different kind of light than maybe you would go and talk to a psychiatrist or something, right. in my opinion. Oh, yeah, exactly. And just for people who are not familiar with eight dimensions of wellness, it was developed by um, Peggy Swarbrick, and um, it's just a way of looking at wellness as being very kind of holistic. There's so the eight dimensions cover all kinds of things, and I probably can't remember them all. But um, well, physical, spiritual is one of them. Spiritual, spiritual is one of them. Physical, yeah. I think financial is another. Environmental. One. Environmental, yeah. So like all and anything you can think of, um, that all those things kind of lead to to our wellness so if like we're if we're um if we don't have housing for example it has those hierarchy of needs right yeah yeah then right. that's going to impact our wellness um so yeah I, I like i like that way of looking at it um i think that you know how let me ask you Oryx, how can someone best affect change within the system Hmm. Within the system, within the system, um, I think we need people doing good work everywhere. So, um, I think the changes within the system are going to be incremental, and they have been incremental. And I've seen. I think we've seen changes over the years within the system. There's, there's more. Um, there's more acceptance of that people get better, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, it didn't used to be that way. Um, there's a little more acceptance on choice around what people want to do, and including medication. Um, and that depends on where you are in the country, too, I think. There's still very 
very heavy on medication, but um, I think there's a little more support around um, choice and realizing that medication is not always the solution for everyone. Um, so yeah, those are a couple things. Um, when you're in, when you're in a hospital system, um, yeah, I, I, I can say that I've, I've had, I've had really good experiences when I was in the, in the hospital where, um, people were very, very kind to me. Um, and I think that makes a difference, you know, I mean, there's also, I've also heard horror stories of people who were very taught to, who were, were very unkind to, yeah. um, I think there's a balance, um, of stories of people who have been kind to, uh, and have been kind to, and people who have been forcefully treated and treated horribly. Um, I guess if you're in the system and uh, you're in uh, as a peer support specialist or anything, you know, just you, or, or just a clinician, psychiatrist, anything, if you lead with your heart, would you say, if you lead with yeah. your heart and you yeah. maybe not so much your, your mind, but more. Yeah. With your heart. Yeah. Yeah. That's, those are the people that reached me just, you could tell you can tell when someone really cares. Um and that's yeah. that those people made a difference for me. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um so um last time we talked you had done a a a a feature film called Healing Voices. Um how is how has that been received since it first came out and what is what is is there anything else that you're working on currently in that kind of realm yeah. of healing voices or just in that like that sure. film film filmography yeah. kind of world yeah so um well the exciting news about healing voices is now we're on amazon prime oh. and um and and the film has been seen by millions of people millions so the goal the goal the goal was this movie we wanted to get out of the choir and we wanted the average person to see it and that's definitely happened um, we've got great feedback um it's got really good ratings and all that so um the film is the film has done really well um the new project is we're, we're working on a film called uh, the working title is pages um and it's about more the um, substance use and addiction world um and uh the cages title comes from the rat park studies of um rats who um all of a sudden when they're in a nicer cage <laughs> and they have a nicer community and they have rat friends and they have things to play on and and they have a beautiful cage, then they don't need the drugs anymore. It's amazing. Like even addicted rats will, will um, kind of withdraw, withdraw on their own, go through painful withdrawal um, and hang out with their rat buddies and say, you know, this is better than the substance. So, um, so the so the film kind of asks like what is your cage what is your environment how does environment impact addiction um it's it's going to be a really cool film and um then another video um or film project is um that we're working on at the national empowerment center is is going is revolving around neurodiversity and it's actually a training around neurodiversity um a guy named Josh Roberts, who goes by South African Josh. It's his neurodiversity gifts training that we're partnering with him on. And we just um, shot it two days in San Diego. We had a really professional studio. We're gonna have um, parts of it with art, artificial intelligence background. Um, it's gonna be an amazing, it is a training. So, so it's not so much a film, but as far as the training, the the videography and the and that and the cinematography is going to be really visually stunning. I don't think there's been anything really done like it in the training world before. So we're really excited about releasing that, um, and we're looking to 
a soft launch on this training in uh, May for, hey. mental, for Mental Health Month. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Awesome. That's, uh, that's awesome. So that you have definitely, you have cages sounds very promising. That sounds like a very cool idea. I remember, you know, I, I I've said this a bunch of times. I always quote you on it. You all, you said to me four years ago, it's not your gene code. It's your zip code. And I always thought that was a beautiful sentiment. So can you kind of get into that a little bit? What do you mean by uh, it's, it's not your gene code. It's your zip code. I mean, yeah. That's your genetic, code. yeah, your genetic, not your genetic code, your zip code. Yes, it's very related to the the cages movie and the environment. Um, and so, um, the research. There's been a lot of research on, um, you know, nature versus nurture, nature versus. Mm -hmm. So, sure. um, but uh, in terms of, um, let's. Go, go with health in general, population health. That's where I'm familiar, more familiar with the research. And that's where I learned that term. Um, it's not your genetic code, it's your zip code. Because of research done on populations and, and health. And what's the, what's a great measure of health in a population? It's lifespan. So um, how long are people living in in a particular area community um and uh and this research has basically found that it's not so much your genetics because you could have very similar genetics and you could have family members kind of spread out in different communities um but it's much more so zip code and it lines up like if you live in a very poor neighborhood um anywhere in the u.s you're more likely to be living you know near um a factory or pollution or um and you're likely to have poorly funded schools um, which lead to poor education, which lead to poor employment outcomes, which lead to, um, you know, people not being very happy. And that leads to violence in the communities, domestic violence, gang violence, um, all kinds of different problems in these communities. And, um, so what you find is that the lifespan in those communities is is remarkably lower than communities where, um, you know, they have more supports. You have access to better food. You have access to better schools, and you don't have as much pollution and all of that. And an interesting thing about these studies is they took out, like I talked about violence. So. Um, they took out deaths that were murders or, you know, things like that. So they, cause that can skew the data, right? Cause you have young people dying at a, um, you know, due to, due to violence. So they just looked at other health things. And, and then you look at um, mental health issues, substance abuse issues, all of these are so much higher in those communities. So, um, and then it results in in early death. So yeah, th these are powerful store uh, studies, and it basically suggests that it's not so much um, your genetics, but it's where it's where you grow up. <laughs> so a family member who grows up in you know a really rough spot uh, is going to have a very different life and outcome probably than a family member that lives in a health more healthy supportive community so i think that makes sense i think that makes total sense um i mean i think it's kind of a, a you know a, a no-brainer when you think about it where you know where wherever you're surrounded from uh you know that's it. but you know there's always a story of someone who you know rags to riches grows up in this yeah. poor neighborhood and yeah, there's, there's, always exceptions. And there's always the exceptions but um you know i i also feel like you know the idea of 
um the people who you surround yourself with uh you know the five six seven people that you surround yourself with are the, are the kind of the you know your your friends your family they're you're most likely gonna be like them you know you right, know? right right yeah you know, you, you, you're you're literally influenced by who you're around um so that brings me to uh, we've been talking for a little while i wanted to ask you two more questions questions and i was gonna let you go we talked about we started talking about girls basketball and coaching and then we went on to the national empowerment center i've read this book called flow and flow is a book about the flow state oryx what gives you flow what puts you in flow state Ooh. um well a lot of times i feel like i'm in the flow at work you know doing emotional cpr training you know interacting with my team and planning things um we're definitely in a flow state when we um filmed the neurodiversity training for example um so i think it comes with working with like minds and um and, and really getting in the flow I just the most recent experience i had because we're comparing basketball is um this past weekend i uh, coached my team and we got we were basically in a flow state the whole weekend as a team i don't think there was a single minute of any game that we you know weren't in that state um just doing the best that we could working together as one unit um it wasn't about individual from coaches and players and um it's really an amazing feeling that's one of the reasons that i coach um and and we ended up actually winning the championship this weekend nice yeah. congratulations uh, yeah it was it was very cool very cool yeah that's awesome. Uh, congratulations. That's huge. Um, it, it sounds like, sounds like that's your flow state. It sounds like coaching, yeah. leading, you know, I was going to say directing, maybe are you, are you directing this uh, new feature? This, uh, uh, um, cages, are you directing it or are you executive producing it or anything like that? Or writing I'm it? a co-producer. Yeah. So it sounds like this is your yeah. flow state. I think, uh, creativity and think that's my flow state. I'll tell you. Yeah. I love, I love this stuff. This stuff I, I I vibe on. I vibe on oddball all the time. So many different moving parts to it, you know. But right. I think I think uh I think that's the the thing, you know. I, oddball listeners, I think the the goal in life is to find some sort 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 of flow state and something that you love, you know. Whether it's you know creating something like emotional CPR or coaching, um, or just leading or just speaking with people, you know. Like I I know I'm doing it on a small yeah. scale. Yeah, I enjoy it. I love it. It's interesting that you mentioned flow state because um, uh, one of the the founders of emotional CPR, Dan Fisher, um, sees you know the reason that we need emotional CPR. That one of the reasons, one main reasons we need is emotional CPR in our life is because when we lose that flow state, we we get stuck. So we're not flowing anymore. We're stuck somewhere and so how can we help someone regain their flow state their 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 um life flow so i love i love what you just said oh thank you i appreciate it i mean i i, I love the idea i think it's such a, a a way of life if you are not i sometimes ask the people that i that uh i mean i am the president and also like executive director or whatever i don't know i i mean we are we're small but mighty and we're you know i'm, I'm bringing some people up um, you know, to, to do podcast editing and things like that and, you know, whatever. But I said, like, do you enjoy what you do? Like, you know, do you enjoy it? If you, if you are enjoying what you do, then it's, it's kind of an old adage. If you enjoy what you do, you don't work a day in your life. But right. um, I mean, honestly, someone might just find flow shooting baskets, keep shooting yeah. baskets. Yeah. I found flow playing basketball. Um, I wish I, I <laughs> Ah, man, you know, uh, literally we, I had the question the other day, what's one thing you wish you could do over again? And one thing was, yes, I wish I could have done wheel of fortune over again and, and not been so anxious. Um, <laughs> but the second thing I really wish I just stuck to my guns and tried out for the basketball team and just stuck with it. You know, mm. um, I, I was, I'm not gonna say, Oh, you, I was bullied and that's why I didn't do it, but I was bullied and that's why I didn't do it. You know? And, uh -huh. and, um, that's something that still sticks with me. That's why I love talking about the game. I love playing basketball. Um, 
I love it. I love it. And it is a flow state for me to just shoot around and shoot hoops. The thing is, one time, <laughs> like I was I was being a peer and I was shooting baskets with someone and I was like, oh, I can do this. And I jumped too high and I was like wearing like, you know, loafers or something. And like I hurt my knees. And I was like, oh, my oh. God. <laughs> I was like limped off the court. Oh, no. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's you know. Um, and then the last thing I was going to ask you is um, what is uh, one thing you are – you're listening to reading or, or watching that you'd like to recommend to, to the listeners. Um, listening to reading or watching. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff that I do outside of work is, I, I'm not I, I I'm not watching a lot of like strictly mental health stuff at the moment, <laughs> but yeah. I would recommend I would recommend my one of my favorite shows is Ted Lasso. Oh, did you watch season three? Is it season three? It's season it? three. Yeah, and I'm I would um I'm I just watched the second episode with my family. Oh man, I want to watch it because yeah. um, I love the end of season. I don't want to but there's a lot of good there's mental health stuff in there um yeah like he's he's going through a lot and he's pro you know processing you yeah know, childhood trauma yeah um yeah it goes that's it, true yeah he is then plus you have the the whole coaching thing which I love so yeah I, I imagine you're enjoying that as well yeah now, I'm gonna ask you one last question is it the strategy of coaching that you like? Is it is it the is it the uh, the X's and the O's? Um, I love everything about it. Honestly, um, your flow works. There it is. I love, I love everything about it, but my maybe my my favorite is is just when the team is playing as a team as a team, not not um, about any any one individual when they're reading the court and they're making the right play so it doesn't matter who ends up scoring they're making the right play as a team whether offensively or defensively um that's that's what that's what i get the most out of and it's just honestly it's just fun it's fun like yeah we we have a great time together there's lots of smiles i love the i love the smiles and like the feeling of accomplishment after learning something new um, it just love. I just love working with kids. Those smiles are so big, and they're so happy about every accomplishment. It's it's awesome. Also, you know, you you have a chance to be the 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 light for them, you know, and and show them like the way, the way to do things and be a better person and be a better player. And yeah, I, I yeah. imagine one of the best feelings is coming back from a coming back when you're down when you're down and you come back that must be an exhilarating feeling to go on a run you know and, it's and funny then win the game it's funny that you mentioned that because that's how we won our championship game we, oh, were, wow. we were down 11 points right away like the other team hit like five threes in a row right out of the shoot and so yeah i love those moments those teachable moments of that's awesome timeout. we call a timeout and it's just like okay they're not going to keep shooting like this. Um, it basketball is a game of runs, and um, but we do need to guard the three point line better. <laughs> so um, and so after that timeout, we just chipped away. I don't think they hit another three the whole game, and their defense was our defense was incredible. I never seen a team play such good defense. They held the other team to six points in the second half. We, oh, we, wow. ended, up, we ended up going winning pretty easily, um, but they could have given up at that point because that other team looked really good and they were making everything. And it's like, oh my god! <laughs> um, but they never they didn't give up and um, and uh, ended up pulling it out. <laughs> so how how uh, okay? So last last thing to say before I let you go because uh, I appreciate your time. How can you equate this to someone who is newly diagnosed with a mental health issue 
um, just had their first break. What, what, well, it's a good, you... yeah, it's a good, it's a good analogy. Um, yeah, I mean, you're you're at that point, and I, you and I have been through it. We're in the kind of in the game of life. We're we're way behind at that point. We're we're down, probably not just ten. We're down like 30, 40 points. So how how do we get our how do we get our life? back (laughs) um and sometimes it is it's just that that belief that you can do it and that chipping away it's not going to happen immediately um you're not going to have a 40 point play but um if you can have those little kind of baby steps and those little victories every day and then eventually you're going to feel a whole lot better and and so there's definitely hope Wow, Oryx, thank you for being on the show. I, I really appreciate that. That was a really great way to end the show. Um, can you uh, just, uh, what, 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 uh, how can we find you, Oryx, what, um, and how can anyone get involved with Emotional CPR? Um, sure. You can find me at the National Empowerment Center, which is www.power2u.org, which is the number two, the letter U. Um, you can find me there. Um, you can find Healing Voices on Prime. Um, and Emotional CPR ha- actually has its own website, emotional-cpr.org. And you also m- mentioned Soteria Houses. We do support um, so the development of Soteria Houses as well. Um, and that's another great crisis alternative. Um, it's a long-term place for people to stay and there's not a whole lot of Soterio houses in the U.S. at this point, but if people are interested in um, in them or in, in developing one, definitely um, contact us. So there you have it. So um, Al Galvez is talking about Soterio houses. Oryx Cohen is talking about Soterio houses. We learned about emotional CPR. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of interesting things that we're not talking about, right? I mean, these are kind of I don't want to say that they're kind of underground. I mean, I feel like Oddball Show is underground anyway. Right. But I feel like all this kind of stuff is underground stuff that if it goes mainstream, I think we're going to have a different mental health system. So get involved with emotional CPR. Learn about Soteria Houses. Learn about National Empowerment Center. Learn about Orcs Cohen. Check out uh, Healing Voices. It's on Amazon Prime right now. Uh, Cages is on its way. Um, and then... Uh, the neurodiverse training, uh, some really cool stuff. And oh, also check out Rokus Lupic and uh, Living Museum. Um, there was a lot of cool stuff we talked about uh, today on Oddball Show. Oryx, what a pleasure. Thank you for being on the show. Um, I think we're in our flow state. Uh, absolutely. This is our flow state. Thank you, Oryx. I will uh, I will talk to you soon. Uh, be well, sir. And um, if you can hold on for just one second. Um, so... Uh, this is Jason Wright. Um, I have just interviewed Oryx Cohen and, uh, thank you so much. Uh, Oryx, it was a pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, be well, my friend, and, uh, we'll talk soon. Yeah. Let's definitely, let's do it again.